Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, happy Palm Sunday. Happy Palm Sunday. What a celebration. What a celebration that we have today, knowing that this is the time that we need to celebrate this Holy Week, these next seven days, and then uh, 40 days after, right? These 40 days of discernment that we, that we uh, be able to salute and acknowledge that Jesus Christ came and died and has risen again, that he has rose again on the third day after his, after his uh, death and resurrection. For, so we thank God once again for what he has done uh, on this great Palm Sunday. I pray that you and your family are being blessed right now. I pray that everything about you, your, your friends, your family, your community, everyone is being blessed right now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. For if it wasn't for him, if it wasn't for Jesus Christ that was on our side, where would we be today? So we thank God once again. This is Palm Sunday. It's a, it's a day of celebration that many people uh, may not know the meaning of it or what's the significance of it, right? And I will get ahead of myself right now as Jesus went forward to Galilee after his uh, resurrection and he tells, uh, tells Mary to go and tell the disciples and Peter also that I am gone to Galilee. Meet me in Galilee. So we thank God once again for what he has done for us yet again today. Uh, and we're, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I am, I am very happy about today. I'm very happy about Palm Sunday. I'm being reminded after many, many years, uh, as far as being a young man and then now a uh, uh, middle-aged man, right, of the significance and the importance of Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, right? So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we want to thank you again for what you have done for us again today. Thank you for Palm Sunday 2021. Many people, Lord Jesus, did not wake up today. And in that, we say thank you. We know that all things work together for good to those who are called according to uh, your purpose and glory. So we thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you have done for us again today. For it, it, it's no accident that we are here today praising your holy name, thanking you for what you have done for us. So we thank you for Palm Sunday, Lord. Thank you for your triumphant entry back into Jerusalem for the very last time uh, in human form. But we know that one day that you will set foot again, and we hope to be there with you, all of us, collectively, as a church. So, Lord, I pray that a message will fall from heaven and not from my mouth. And I pray that you will get all the glory, honor, and praise for everything that's coming out of my mouth out of this sanctuary today. But not only here, but the millions of churches all across the world bless us and keep us. And I pray that hearts will be transformed. I pray that messages through, through Zoom and through Skype and through telephones or uh, whatever, Lord, through emails, that lives will be transformed, that people will learn and know more about Jesus Christ and the significance of Palm Sunday, right? And Resurrection Sunday on next week. So we thank you, Lord, for, for again, another day, a reasonable portion of good health and strength, and though all things are not perfect right now, we do praise your name, Lord. Even though we're down in this hole, Lord, right now, that we, that we are praying that you throw a rope down and, and pull us out, we will wait for you to come and get us. So we thank you, Lord, once again. And praise your holy name. Thank you for Palm Sunday. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So once again, thank we want to thank God for allowing him uh, to give us breath, right? To be able to breathe once again, to be able to uh, understand that, that this life is a purpose, that we, you have given us purpose and that uh, we should not take these things for granted, that life is a precious, precious gift. And you exemplify that on the cross one day uh, in Jerusalem. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Amen. The book of Luke, chapter 20, is where we're going to come from today, Shelby. The book of Luke, chapter 20. The book of Luke, chapter 20. And this segues, and this will be um, a bridge to what we're talking about today, this Palm Sunday event, right? This historic event. And when you look into the Gospels, there's different interpretations of it. Luke spends a lot more time. He provides more detail about Palm Sunday and what had occurred, right? John just takes a few, a few verses and talks about Palm Sunday, but Luke spends some time, and that's why I'm excited about preaching from the book of Luke chapter 20 today as we segue into Palm Sunday. And what does this mean, right? And when, you, when we read through this text today, we're going to wonder, I mean, you're going to wonder like, okay, this is, how does this relate to Palm Sunday? Well, it does relate to Palm Sunday, and you're, gonna, you're about to see. So the book of Luke chapter 20 talks about the authority of Jesus Christ. So as we picture in our own minds, in our hearts, right, 
how we see this Jesus Christ, the Messiah, right? How he is triumphantly coming into Jerusalem for the very last time. How he has wiped tears from his eyes as he has come down the mountain and he, he is crying because he knows that uh, much later that, uh, that, that the Romans will, will uh, access, really, really put a lot of pressure on the people of Israel. Right, that that thousands of people will be crucified and 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 murdered and killed on behalf of Jesus Christ. Things will not get better after His ascension into heaven. You would think that they would, but things actually get perpetually worse. Sixty years later, the Romans come in and they just really terrorize Jerusalem. They set the temple on fire. So this is why Jesus is crying. He foresees. He knows what's about to happen. So he is crying as he enters in Jerusalem, not for himself but for the people and for the events that are about to transpire. Hmm. So when we think about the importance of Palm Sunday, many of us interpret the monumental importance of the day as we focus on God himself, having wiped tears from his eyes, as I stated, right? And we got to keep that in mind, how the, how the dust, right? The dust from the road is, is mingling with his teardrops as he's coming down off the mountain with his disciples and probably hundreds of followers behind him. And he realizes what's about to happen in the next 60 years. And he's not crying for himself. He's crying for all those who are there now and those uh, pregnant women that will be pregnant during that time, right? There's always significance throughout the scriptures, right? These doublets. And so he sees the weeping of men and women at the devastation of what is awaiting Jerusalem in the future. And what awaits Jerusalem is yet another uh, uh, captivity, right, after he ascends into heaven. Roman oppression becomes more brutal. And as I stated, the killing over 3,000 Jewish citizens, probably even more. And namely this, the taxes increase. So Kent, the taxes increase. Things get perpetually worse in Jerusalem. Things have to get better, but we would think, hey, Jesus Christ, he came and he did all these wonderful things. And now I hear that he rose again uh, on, the, on the third day. He rose again on Sunday. And I've, I've heard that he's in Galilee preaching and uh, hundreds have told me he's here and he's there and this. Right. But here we are today and, and we're thinking that, oh, things are going to get so much better. But no, they get perpetually worse. And the apostles realize this after he ascends into heaven, after he gives them the great commission that they need to go out and preach and teach the gospel to every creature in the the world because I come quickly, the book of Mark says. So let's get into this on this Palm Sunday. Happy Palm Sunday. This is a glorious day. This is a beautiful day to be alive, right? To witness, to be able to even talk about this and tell our friends and neighbors about the significance of Palm Sunday, waving these palms in our air today. So our text, Luke 20, verses 9 through 17, and I won't keep you long, right? But we're going to get into this, right? Then began he to speak, Luke 20, Luke, the 20th chapter, 9 through 17. Then began he to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and led it forth to husbandmen and went into a far country for a long time. And we're going to break this down in a minute. We're going to unpack this in a second. And at the season, he sent a servant to his husbandman that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard. But the husbandman beat him and sent him away empty. Hmm. And again, he sent another servant and they beat him also and entreated him shamefully and sent him away empty. And again, he sent a third and they wounded him also and they cast him out. Then said the Lord of the vineyard in verse 13, what shall I do? When you first read this, and I've been reading this for many, many years, and I get the same reaction each time I read it, it's like you either want to laugh or cry, right? And I'll get to that in a moment. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be well that they reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves saying, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance may be ours. Right. And the reason why I bring up the fact that this is kind of humorous, you look at it in two different ways. Right. If you look at it from a Christological viewpoint, right, Christ being the son of God, he, you know, all three. Right. Jesus Christ, the son, the father, the Holy Ghost. Right. He is reasoning within himself. Right. That all these prophets who I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm excited about Palm Sunday. Even though I have sent these prophets for thousands of years, one after another, one after another, and you, you have refused them, you've rejected them, I put you in captivity, you rejected them, and I, I told you to go and sacrifice again and rebuild the temple again. I want you to do all these great things once again for my sake, right? 
and you beat them and you refuse uh, to, to allow them to, to have a voice, right? You sent them away bruised, right? Spiritually bu bruised over and over again. So now God is pretty much saying, hmm, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be well reverenced when they see him. I am thinking that if they see my son, that they will have a change of heart. Verse 14, but when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves saying, this is the heir, come let us kill him that the inheritance may be ours. The first thing that popped into my head the other day when I was reading through this passage of scripture, and don't laugh at me, but many of us have seen movies over and over again. And this, and this is how Hollywood does their movies, right? These, these suspense movies, these action movies, right? It's like, uh, first example that came to mind was like uh, Bruce Lee. We've all seen these Bruce Lee movies, right? He doesn't want to fight anymore. He doesn't want to hurt anyone anymore, right? You have killed, he returns home. You have killed what? My teacher, right? Now you have killed my family. And Bruce Lee goes and, and vengeance is his, right? That's what I get from this text is that, wait a minute, I'm going to send many of you, you know, who, who have brothers and sisters or who have cousins and stuff who have, who have uh, protected you over the years when there was a street fight or bullies came upon you and uh, the little ones are getting beat up and bullied all the time. And then, and then all of a sudden, you know, the, the little brother or little sister tells the big brother or big sister that such and such is bullying them. Oh, wait till I send my big brother or my big sister. They'll handle this situation. That's what I get from this text here. Jesus is like, huh, they're not respecting any of these people that I have sent before. If I send my son, maybe they'll reverence him also, but they killed him. Hmm. So what shall I do? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Amen. So on today, we celebrate this, this triumphant entry of Jesus arriving in Jerusalem on a donkey, which is, which is sort of an oxymoron, but it's a, a very important thing because any, anyone who was of, of kingship would arrive on a donkey, right? To, to show peace. Being on, being on the donkey and the palm branches is a representation of peace, that I'm coming in peace, not to do war, not to overturn the government, not to do anything that's going to upset the balance, the equilibrium of society. I'm coming in peace on a donkey. And he is there to preach and illustrate his power without hurting anyone. But anyone but, uh, but showing the world through his death and resurrection, his authority. This is about God's authority and his power, right? Luke 20 is about God's authority. The entire chapter is about God's authority, right? The Pharisees and the Sadducees and scribes and says, listen, you're doing all these great things, but by whose authority are you doing these things? We're not totally against what you're doing, but are you coming in the name of God or yourself? Where is this authority coming from? Hmm. Jesus is there to end his earthly life, right? And sit once again in eternity next to his father who is in heaven on the right hand side. He's there to allow us to see through these stained glass windows, remember Pratt, right? More clearly for the only way we can see clearly through the spirit, our spiritual lenses is to see Christ through his purpose his ministry, his Old Testament relationship with Adam, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and the prophets, right? His teachings, his miracles, this is how he is showing himself, his prophecy, his death, his resurrection, and his message to everyone, the Great Commission, go and tell everyone the good news that the Messiah has come, that you are now saved, that your sins now are forgiven, Right. If you go all the way to verse one, it says, and, and this is how we're going to paint our picture today. Amen. Travis Pitts. And it came to pass that on one of those days, as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes came upon him with the elders. So that's the picture. Right. As we're getting into this text, we see Jesus sitting at the uh, uh, sitting up there. You know, he's probably sitting amongst the people and the people are all around him. He's sitting there with his legs crossed and he's he's given a testimony about what the kingdom of heaven looks like. Or people may be asking questions about, hey, I was at the Sermon on the Mount. What would that what did that mean when you said this and this and this? And Jesus is pouring out for the last time the significance of why he why he is here. Amen. Whoo. So now we arrive at the setting. We see him in the house that his father built. Amen. We see Jesus again teaching and preaching the gospel. And yet there arrive these witnesses to reject and question his authority, his earthly authority, but heavenly authority as well. Really? Are you who you say you are? Right? 
For as we know that many have conceived and believed that, yes, he is a prophet, a prophet, a mighty prophet indeed. He could be Elijah. He could be John the Baptist, right? But is he the Messiah? By what authority are you doing these things? Hmm. So here we go. Could this be the Messiah? Could this be the one that John spoke of? Whose sandals I am not worthy to latch it, right? This, this Messiah's father actually said that this is my beloved son. John heard it, right? James heard it. They, they heard it, right? I heard, you know, I saw this dove ascending out of heaven, right? And I heard right through my spiritual intellect, right? This is my beloved son of who I am well pleased. And then goes on to tell the disciples, right, at Mount Transfiguration to listen to him. Another message from God or from the heavens, right? Because this is the one that Moses spoke about. Whew. So now we begin to see the picture as it is unfolding. He is sitting there. He is sitting there, right? And he's preaching and he's teaching for the very last time, right? And get this, as a minister or just as a believer, even if I wasn't even preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? It would still not be a great surprise to me, and it shouldn't be to you as well, right? That, you, that we're seeing this Jesus sitting on a donkey, Ooh, that's right? And with all glory, sitting on the right-hand side of the Father, which is in heaven, right? The bush that burned in the presence of Moses shouldn't be no big surprise. I shouldn't be in awe of that, right? A bush that is, is, is burning but not being saturated, right? That, that God is speaking through this burning bush, right? I'm not in all of that, right? This is just God being God, right? The vision that Daniel speaks on, it's no surprise to me. I, I'm not shocked or in awe of Christ uh, 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 sitting with Abraham on a hot desert day with two, de two, with two angels by his side, right? By his side, informing Abraham that I am about to go down and destroy the city and having this dialogue and this debate with Abraham that if I find 50 righteous, will you destroy the city? No. How about 40? How about 30? How about 20? How about two? How about just one? If I find one righteous person in the city, will you destroy the city? I will not destroy the city for your sake. This is Jesus Christ having a conversation with Abraham. So I'm not in awe that he's on a donkey. That's no, you know, but as believers, this is like, hey, this is Christ. I mean, this is, he comes in many forms, right? He can do whatever he wants to do. Hmm. So if you are a believer, a true believer, all right, and you've been through some things, talking about us in 2020, 2021 now, right? And we have struggled with trying to know more about Christ. How can I learn more about Christ? How can I get closer to you, right? Then there should be no big surprise that Jesus took, that, that, took, that he took a mission, right? A 40 generation mission since the beginning of time, dropped down out of heaven, over 40 generations and came and dwelt among men not just in the new testament he's been here since the time of noah since the time of adam adam where art thou right who told you you were naked he's been here since the beginning of time right there's no big surprise that his word became flesh right and he dwelt among us and we beheld his eternal glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth. So if you're a true believer, uh, then walking on water and, and feeding 5,000 people, not counting men and women, maybe 10,000 people, healing the blind man, many blind people who had been blind since birth, raising many from the dead, right? The scriptures just t give us a few examples, but I'm sure he did this for a, a three-year ministry. I'm sure he did this to hundreds of people, right? No earth shattering news, right? It's just Jesus, the son of the living God, the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. 42 generations. So as we jump into our text, right? I'm excited. This is Palm Sunday, right? Christ tells us that the true vine and my father is the husbandman. That's what, that's what this text is. That's what this parable is all about, right? As you read this, every branch in me that, that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Right. And every branch that bear fruit, he purges it and that and that it may bring forth more fruit. So the purpose of storytelling. Right. And, and I'm going to digress for a moment because I'm really wanting to drive this, drive this hard, drive this home hard. Robert Clyde Johnson, this author that I've been reading uh, 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 ex extensively for the past several weeks. Right. From like the 1940s, I've got this book from uh, from the Candler School of Theology that they were throwing away. And I have been reading this book. Right. So Robert Clyde Johnson wrote this, that Christianity, if you have noticed, is concerned with storytelling, right? The Old Testament is packed with dramatic stories, right? One following uh, upon another, one after another. Well, the Gospels are the story of Jesus, the acts 
of the apostles is a collection of stories about the infant Christian church. Get that, right? It's about the creation of Common Ground Baptist Church or, or, or Second Baptist Church in Pratt or, or our churches in Pahuska or our churches in Oklahoma City. It's about the church, the infancy of the church, how it got started, right? The challenges that took place in order for the churches to be established. So when the early apostles set out to carry the Christian faith to the world, they did so by telling a story. Even Jesus himself told stories, illustrating the truth that he brought with one vivid and varied story after another. The only way you're going to understand what I'm talking about is if I tell you a story, because my thoughts are too big for you. If I tell you exactly what heaven looks like, you're not going to comprehend it. So let me tell you about what you do each and every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that you are planting seeds, that you are sowing and reaping, right? Let me paint a picture that, uh, that, that the God of the lights, right? It's the husbandman, right? He is the one who has bought the land. Woo, he has bought the land, and he is the one who has went out and, and, and told us to plant the seeds, amen. And he is the one who has told us to go out and water the seeds that they may bring forth fruit. That is the significance of the story, right? So here we go. Even Jesus himself told stories illustrating the truth, right, that he brought with one vivid and varied story after another. This is no accident. It even can be said that there is something inedible about story, right? We all know that story is, is, is sh uh, short-ended for history, right? So we have seen that the peculiar thing about Christianity is that it, that it, that it roots faith in history, okay? It is unique center uh, is is in what God is what Christ has done right in the history that is his story the story of Jesus Christ so the center of biblical storytelling is the center of God's action in history right in the life death and resurrection of Jesus Christ it's about his story telling faith God confronts living man when they live because God is a God of the living and not of the dead. Hmm. To the text. Then began he to speak to the people this parable. Remember, chapter 20 is about the authority of Jesus Christ, the power of God, right? A certain man planted a vineyard, and as I stated, a certain man meeting Christ, meaning God. I planted uh, here on earth, right, this faith, this, 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 this thing that you should accept, right? It's a free gift. I, I planted it, right? And I set it forth to in this story, to the apostles, right, or, uh, or, or to the Pharisees, or to whoever was uh, willing to accept it, right? And then I went to a far country for a long time. So I planted these seeds, and then I went someplace. And at the season, right, I sent forth uh, uh, a servant to the husbandman that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard, but the husbandman beat him and sent him away empty. So in this particular text, you can clearly state that more than likely this means the Pharisees. These are the non-believers. These are the ones who are believing in Mosaic laws, right? Or the laws or the things that Abraham did. And they're not ready to accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah, right? So Christ is telling them that they have rejected me. The first set of prophets, right? The first set of kings, right? Who preached my name, who told them about me. David, right? Go on down the line. You have rejected them. Hmm. And at the season, he sent the servant to the husbandman that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard. But the husband beat him and sent him away empty. All right. So here we go. Jesus Christological explanation to the first portion of this parable. Right. Is for us to understand the characters and the setting and the location. Jesus begins to tell his audience, mainly the Pharisees and the scribes. Right. And the Jewish people at that time. That if you choose to understand this parable, you must first try to understand the characters and the time and space of the event. I know I'm beating this to death, but it's very important that we get this. That a man planted a vineyard, meaning he himself, the son of God, here on earth. And upon that creation, he set forth spiritual overseers, right? If you may, or, or prophets or kings, right? And during the institution of hiring and, and the placing of his people, a certain segment of society chose not to listen to the commandments of God. This is why Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem is so important. Because there are many out there waving their palm branches, meaning peace, and he is on a donkey, and he is signifying peace. This is peace. I'm coming in peace, right? But there are many in the shadows watching, watching who he is not believing who he is. This is not the Messiah. I know him. I know his history. 
I know his mother and father. I know Joseph. I know Mary. I know these people. I know his brothers and sisters. I used to see Jesus running up and down the street playing. This cannot be the Messiah, could it? Hmm. They were envious, right? Their hearts were filled with strife and, and jealousy and unrighteousness. And can you imagine the conflict and the confusion that's going on? Right? We have been waiting for a Messiah, for a Savior for over two or three thousand years. And could this be the one? Could this be the one that's going to redeem and save all of Israel? And in what method? How is he supposed to do this? Is he supposed to throw the, overthrow the Roman government and set us all free and we would be a world power? Or should we go back into the text and, and, and realize that it's not about that, that it's about saving souls, winning souls back to him, that it's a, it's a much bigger picture, that he is here to redeem us, to reconcile us back into salvation, back into paradise, going back into the times of Adam. has nothing to do with the Romans being in control. I'm here to save souls. So they were, they were envious. They were jealous. And though these prophets and the kings tried to do what was right by planting and sowing throughout these thousands of years and, and reaping in the process of time, sin overcame the husbandmen and they sought to take what didn't belong to them in the first place. They sought to steal, kill, and destroy. Remember, the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees and the scribes, they're all about money. I want the biggest house. I want to sit in, in, the, in the highest chambers of the court. I, I want to be in the best places. I'm even going to expand my robe. I want people to know that I am a rabbi sent by God. Hmm. Though Moses tried to do what was right by the people, I'm giving you some examples, right? Though he was a friend of God, right? Powerful. Spoke to him face to face, Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus. Married an Ethiopian woman. Ooh, really? Brothers and sisters didn't like that. Though he didn't cross the promised land with the 12 tribes and with Joshua, we eventually see him at Mount Transfiguration having this conversation with Elijah and Jesus. So he did finally cross over Jordan. Amen. He didn't cross over in the flesh, but he crossed over in the spirit and you rejected him. This is just like the word of God as truth begins to be told, right? And this reluctance towards seeking truth and justice and winning souls to Christ. This rejection in society, right? This agitation towards righteousness and a seek to do harm, to hang on to power, right? We see that in today's society. We turn on the news. It, it, people are just wanting to hang on to power like they're going to live here forever. Why don't you do what is right, as I've stated time and time again, by saving one? This is an everlasting covenant it, from time, from the very beginning, from if it was Abraham, it was Isaac, it was Jacob, it was Noah. You can go on and on and on that he's always establishing a covenant. Listen, you keep messing up here. You keep rejecting me here, but let me establish a covenant, right? You, you're refusing to accept me, though I am your savior. Let me establish a covenant, right? I keep giving you one chance after another. I'll just keep establishing an agreement between me and you that you understand, right, who I am. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and after I have uh, destroyed the earth, I'm going to establish, once again, a covenant so that you may understand that, 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 that the evil in your hearts and minds will remain in all men, but I'm still going to love you anyway. I'm not going to destroy the world, right, for your sake anymore or for my sake. Let me establish a covenant that thousands of years later, I'm just going to have to send my son to redeem the world. Hmm. Because I am a God of love and peace and compassion, forgiveness. I am a God full of grace. Amen. Verse 11. And again, he sent another servant and they beat him also. Once again, we can, uh, you know, this, this is Christ talking, this parable. You know, he's been here since the beginning of time. He knows about Jeremiah. He was with Jeremiah, had conversation with Daniel, had conversation with Zechariah and Zephaniah. He knows about their trials, their tribulations, and how they were rejected by the Hebrew people. I would be remiss if we didn't think about the prophet Jeremiah. He was, he was a, a young man of faith. He, and he lacked the integrity and the self-esteem to move forward, but God nudged him. He told him to go to the people, tell them that they have to repent and change their ways, return back to me during this time of captivity. Jeremiah was born into captivity. He lived in captivity. And God has sent this young man, right? I want you to go and tell the people to repent and do what is right. I don't want you to worry about captivity. Don't worry about the Babylonians, right? Don't worry about the religious leaders. Just preach and teach the commandments that I have given to you. 
Verse 12, and again, he sent a third and they wounded him also and cast him out, right? So in the process of time, one like Elijah came, right? And they dissuaded him from doing what was right in the sight of God. And they choose not to listen, right? The people choose to listen to Baal and these other prophets. They choose to follow kings and princesses instead of the prophet of God. But, but in the process of time, the word of God we find is manifest across the land. God always has a number of followers we don't know about. Ooh. Scripture tells us in Kings that, listen, Elijah, let me have this conversation with you. They have rejected me, even though I know that I am their God. And I have made a promise that I'm going to be their God from this time until the end of times, that I'm going to be their God, right? But I have 7,000 people that you don't know about who have not bowed down to Baal. Hmm. And also, I'm going to replace you, not because of your disobedience, but because you're tired, right? You've done a lot of great things, Elijah, right? And not only that, in a little while, you're not even going to die a physical death. I'm just going to send my chariot down to pick you up and take you into heaven to be with me. And then I'm going to show you my son at Mount Transfiguration, and you're going to be standing next to Moses. What? Are you serious? So after a few years of training, right, we have Elijah who, is replaced, who replaces Elijah, right, who will become God's spokesman to the northern kingdom, right? I know I'm going deep in this, but I got to preach this on Palm Sunday. And his ministry will be filled with the signs and the miracles and the proclamations and warnings. This is Elijah, right? He will become known as the prophet of peace and healing. He was so introverted. I think I brought this up before. And they called him the bald head prophet. Wouldn't answer the door when the king came knocking on the door. I mean, this guy was different, but he was a prophet of God and took over, right, the mantle of Elijah. So there are many directions we can go in this text as we think about Jesus in this parable. What is he talking about? And we have to focus on those who despised him the most, right? And as I say that the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, the Sadducees who didn't believe in uh, a resurrection, right? He had to convince them throughout the text, right? Whichever gospel you're reading that, listen, there is a resurrection. I know you don't believe it, but I'm trying to uh, tell you and try to preach and teach to you that resurrection does exist. Hmm. These are those who spoke about truth and prosperity and righteousness, but were the most unrighteous of them all, right? These Pharisees, Sadducees, they were unrighteous people. They were well-trained and, and brought up under the false teachings, but, but should have paid attention to the teachings of Gamaliel, who, who promoted Pharisee teaching and an acceptance of the teachings of Jesus, right? But no, they were more concerned with doing good works and deeds for themselves, so they could be seen by men. They made broad their phylacteries, the scripture says, as I stated, and they enlarged the borders of their garments and they enjoyed the uppermost rooms at the feast, right? They loved banquets and feasts and be seen by people. And they loved the greetings in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi, rabbi. Got to be careful about self-pride. Verse 13, then said the Lord of the vineyard, what shall I do? Going back to the humor again. What shall I do? Now I will send my beloved son, even though I know the outcome. Now I'm just going to send him. It may be that, that they will reverence him when they see him, right? I mean, he's, he's my right hand. He's from my lineage. He's part of my DNA. He's my son. He's a mere image of me. If they don't respect the prophets and all those before me, and then I send my son, and then they reject him, what do you think I'm going to do to these people? Is the funny part. As I digress, right, Travis and Ken and everyone, as I digress, I, back in the 80s, you know, I know there's a, a, a new equalizer, right, the equalizer. Back in the 80s, I love watching the equalizer because these people, they were always in trouble in New York City, right? This guy drove a Jaguar and he was well trained and this and this and uh, people's kids were being kidnapped or women were being abused or or some, uh, bad things were happening a mob and mafia and all these people were always trying to hurt innocent people right and they would say I, I can't go to the police I need to find someone that can handle this situation for once and for all right and what they would do is they'd call this man the equalizer and he would come and save the day he would come and handle the situation right in a very uh, conspicuous, a very private way, he would handle the situation. 
It's almost like I said before, I'm going to say, listen, you beat me. I have a black eye, but wait till you meet my big brother. Hmm. What shall I do? The Lord of the vineyard says. Now they have, they have, they have chastised. They have beaten all these people that have came before me. Now what am I going to do? Right? So here we go. Jesus triumphant entry into Jerusalem. I will send my beloved son. Surely they will reverence him. Close your eyes and picture him for a second on a donkey and you can't even hear yourself think how these hundreds, maybe even thousands of people are waving these palm branches and throwing their very best mantles, their very best coats on the road that this donkey is walking over. He's coming in peace. Surely they will reference him. I've heard about Jesus. He has been all over Israel and he has uh, been to the unbelievers. He's been to the Gentiles as well as the Jews and the Gentiles have accepted him and he has raised many from the dead. He's healed many. He's cast out demons. Surely they will reverence him. He has done absolutely nothing. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. He is the Messiah. He's got to be the Messiah. We believe in you, Jesus. Right? Surely they will reverence him. But if they don't, what shall I do? Hmm. I will send my beloved son. It may be well that they reverence him when they see him. Picture him. Can't emphasize that enough. People, tears coming down their eyes. Many people who had been healed by Jesus are in the crowd and they're screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Listen, I was blind. Look at me. I was blind. But now I, I see. I, I couldn't even hear. And now I'm able to hear. I used to be blind, deaf, and dumb. And look what he's done for me. This is the man, the man on the donkey right there. That's the man. He is the one who heard, he, he held my, he heard my cry. Blind, blind Bartimaeus is there, right? I was, I was just saying, Lord, help me. Son of David, help me. And people kept trying to silence me, kept telling, telling me to be quiet and go someplace and sit down. But I yelled even more, Lord, help me, help me. And he helped me. All these people are in the crowd. Many that he raised from the dead are in the crowd. That's him. That's Jesus. He is the Messiah. You have to believe that he is the Messiah. He's on a donkey. He's coming in peace. Hosanna in the highest. I don't know what we're going to do about the Romans, but all I know is I trust in Jesus. So they cast him out of the vineyard and they killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? This is why we are here today, whether on a Zoom call, whether at a church that's socially distanced, right? Whether you're on a telephone having prayer discussions over coffee with someone, Convincing one another of the importance of this time of Palm Sunday. And this, this is our holy week that we should reverence with all of our heart, soul, and mind. This is not a plaything. That for the next seven days that we pay close attention, praying even more and even harder. Recognizing that he is the Messiah. That he has came and died for all of our sins. Surely they will reverence him. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted, Isaiah says. With grief, and, and we hid as if it were our faces from him, and he was despised, and we esteemed him not. All we did was turn our backs on him. Surely, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him, smitten of God and afflicted. But here's the shout But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, we are now healed. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. What's going to happen to him seven days later after the, the final preachings and the teachings? And we know that uh, just a few hours ago, he probably woke up from the, from the house of, uh, of Zacchaeus, right? The man who climbed up the sycamore tree. And I'm sure he's in the crowd too, right? He's probably on the front row now. He don't have to climb up a tree anymore. He was at my house last night. What? You you used to steal from us. No, but I'm going to pay you back four times more than what I stole from you. Hosanna in the highest. Isaiah goes on to say, all we like sheep have gone astray. And we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And Jesus was oppressed and he was afflicted. And yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He came for a purpose, y'all. And our purpose today is just to serve him 
and tell others about him. That's it. Someone's having a bad day and they're just uh, rhetorically going on and on and on about their situation. Hey, have you considered Jesus? I know things may not be going right for you today, but when we have this conversation again next week, tell me about your situation after we pray with Jesus. Did it get perpetually worse? Or did God provide a solution for you in your time of need? Hmm. Luke 18, as, we, as I begin to close, Luke 18 tells us that, that when the Son of Man, ooh, it says it tells us that when the Son of Man comes, get this now, will he find faith on the earth? I know many of you have read this passage of Scripture before, and you're wondering, what does that mean? Read it slow. It says, Luke 18 tells us that when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? It already answers this question, right? The simple answer is that, yes, he will find faithful people, right? Those that belong to him. But the act of faith will be no more. There will be no more need of faith. Why? Because he is already here. There will be no need to continue to do what is right or even to pray because when the Lord comes, whoo, he is coming as a thief in the night. You we've read this over and over again. He will not tarry long, the scripture says. He will come and take up his church and there will be, and there we will be with him forevermore. But in the, but, but in the time, our, 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 but in our time, our job is to continue just to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, to proclaim the acceptable year of our Lord Jesus Christ, to separate the sheep from the goats is what he's going to do. And he's going to separate the wheat from the tares. He says, when I come, I will separate them. Don't you judge. Christ is coming to set captives free, to establish an everlasting kingdom spoke about by these prophets that were despised and beaten thousands of years earlier. Surely they will reverence him. He is my son, my only son, the one sent to save the world from sin. He shall come and destroy those husbandmen. That's what God says. And she'll give the vineyard to others. That's the promise. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, Kent and Travis, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Mm -hmm. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you're going to know. Because I'm going to be there with you from here until eternity. Amen. And he be beheld him. What, what, what is this then that, that is written? The stone, with, ooh, verse 17. The stone that the builders... Uh, uh, rejected the same which become the head of the corner right this is spoken of in, in the book of psalms and several other places in scripture as well it means i am the foundation i am the equalizer i am the one who's going to keep everything in balance it doesn't matter how that house blows north south east or west no matter how the rain comes in no matter if the roof begins to leak i am the foundation of this situation that we're in right now i am the creator of all of this as the earth remaineth, Craig and, 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 and Pastor O and the pastors that we, we talk on Saturdays, right? As the earth remaineth, there will always be seed time and harvest, right? Day and night, right? Hot and cold, as long as the earth remains. So as I close, this particular parable is one of Christ speaking of the touching of his anointed. Namely, right? This is what he said. He says, touch not my anointed, which are on this call today. And do my prophets no harm. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I sent one, and you beat him. Didn't even want to pay attention to him. You sent him away, bruised. Then I sent another one, and you beat him. Sent him away, bruised. Then I sent someone else. You sent him away, bruised. Surely they will reverence my son. God has given us not one chance, two Three, this is the last time God is doing this for all of us. God is a God of passion, love, and peace, and empathy, and, and compassion, and grace. And, 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 but, but he is also one of wrath, and he hates sin. And it, 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 Scripture says in Isaiah 65 and 8, he can't stand it. It stinks in his nostrils. Enjoy your Palm Sunday. I hope we've all, we all have something to think about today. Surely we can reverence him. 
when we think about the crucifixion or when we think about the uh, uh, even the birth of Jesus Christ, you know, that all calendars, all time is represent- represented uh, through Jesus Christ. That we, you know, w- whenever we reference things, we always say, oh, it's been 2000, right? This is 2021, right? It's been 2021 years since the birth of Jesus Christ. Hmm. So in the meantime, let us continue to reverence him. Surely they will reverence him. This is our last chance. We don't have that. There's no more second guessing. We cannot be like the Pharisees up in the high places and enjoying the the banquets and having parties and wanting to be seen by men. That is temporal. But the things of this world, the things of God are eternal, invisible and eternal. That's where we're trying to get to. What we're doing right now is temporary. Each and every one of us on this call knows someone who has died in the past 12 months. Or maybe two and three people. They went on into eternal glory. That's how serious this is. So Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Surely we can reverence him. That man on the donkey. Yeah, that's him. I was blind and now I see. I couldn't even walk, but now I'm able to walk. I was on a bed of affliction for 38 years. And he told me to just take up my bed and go home. And I did. And now I'm accepted back in community. Hmm. There's another blind man, and he was in a society that was so bad. It took Jesus two or three times to, to touch him and to say, you know what? I'm going to heal you, right? I know you see these leaves as, as men, but, but, but let, let, me he, let me heal you. But as, when I heal you, I don't want you to go back there anymore because those people lack faith. So let us have faith and reverence him today. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for coming in this place today. And I pray that a word fell from heaven and not from me. And I pray that you may continue to help me understand the significance of Palm Sunday and what's going to, what's about to happen in these next seven days, how you woke up each and every morning, early in the morning and went outside the city to pray in silence. And it says that great uh, multitudes of people followed you. I can't help but picture these things that you, that you had no peace, right? Throughout those seven days, and, and and I do know, Lord Jesus, that you that you that you continue to move forward. That you, uh, the Scripture tells us in the book of, the book of Mark says that you continue to, uh, you know, that that your word continue to uh, demise that 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 people uh, thought to thought less of you the closer you got to got to the cross. Oh Lord, just thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you have done for us. Uh, you've made it clear to us. You said if you if we just confess with our mouths that you are the Son of the God, Son of God, and that you uh, that you died and rose again on the third day, that we would be saved. It's as simple as that. So if there's someone on this call who doesn't know Jesus Christ as a pardon of their sins, just confess right now. You can confess out loud. You confess within your heart that Jesus Christ, you are the Son of the Living God, and I believe it. And God doesn't go back on His promise as long as you meant that within your heart. You are now saved. So when you close your eyes for the very last time, paradise awaits you. For we do know, Lord, that that, that, that on that that day that you were crucified, there was a thief. One on the right and one on the left. And one said, Lord, you're a righteous man. Tell me, whenever you go into paradise, right, will you remember me? And Jesus said, from this day forward, you will be with me in paradise. So that's the assurity that we have today. Let us reverence him like the thief on the cross, because that's where we are. We're our bene- we are our benefactors. Forgive us of our sins today, Lord Jesus, and watch over us and be with us and bless us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Everyone, thank you for joining again. Um, thank you for showing up last Sunday, waiting an extra hour or so. Um, uh, for uh, Reverend Ryan's anniversary service, and thank you for showing up and and uh, supporting uh, uh, supporting this ministry and actually uh, listening to the Word of God uh, through another mechanism and through another church mechanism. So thank you for joining on last Sunday. So let us continue to be in prayer for the next several days and go into the Scripture and read it and say, you know, what happened on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, right? What happened on these days, right? So we thank God for what you have done. Next Sunday, we will have communion. So just a reminder uh, to have, uh, if, you, if you choose to join the service, to have uh, uh, crackers or juice. Or I know back in the days in Pratt, you know, it was Welch's or even in Pahuska, you know, it was the Welch's juice, you know. And uh, me and my brothers would always uh, 
run downstairs on communion Sundays and go downstairs, don't tell anyone, and finish the juices. My mother would say, here, 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 and we would take all the juices and just finish them, finish them, finish them, not knowing what we were doing. We were, we were contaminating the elements. <laughs> but anyway, until we uh, began to further understand the significance of that, it was no more plaything. So. But anyway, I hope to see you again on next Sunday. Continue to be in prayer. Uh, continue to be safe. I know uh, the world is changing. Many of us are being vaccinated. Many of us are thinking about being vaccinated against COVID. Um, we have our last shot on this coming Saturday. Glory be to God. I think it is uh, the way to go. So be safe out there. And uh, I love every, uh, each and every one of you. Uh, may God bless you and keep you on this day. Take care. I love you.